All right, so here's another situation out of a junk distributor. You might as well make something out of it. And a tool for driving the oil pump is nice to have. And since he works on so many different cars, this one is going to be for a Ford. It's got a hex, like an Allen wrench, inside the end. There's probably a special tool for this, but I just stop this from turning and then you know, screw the other one up. There's a bushing here, so I'll probably just turn it down to this face. Chop these down to nothing. We'll probably grind it first and then turn it. It's pretty rough. But we're going to put a new seal in it. It might be just due to this stamping. Every engine might be different, but you'll see a ridge. And we were just cleaning this up to stick the new one in. I think we might put a little smear of silicone behind it just to keep any oil from weeping behind this new seal. Just a thin smear. Pretty good to me. It's so freaking rusted and pitted, this is the only thing that'll do it. That is ugly. <laughs> it's like a porcupine. So we never did a paint job on an engine where we used metal etch primer, so it'll be interesting to find out if the paint stays on. We aren't doing this like a rebuild like you're making a race car engine, but if you would have seen what the valve covers looked like or when we took this apart, we're just giving this a little bit extra life, cleaning up all the parts and painting it. We used to call this a Ditzler rebuild, or you could call it a Krylon rebuild. Getting rid of all the rust and painting it and cleaning out the insides. You know, where there was dirt and grit, just cleaning them off, clean the bowl, you just wipe everything, and then we re-lubricate it. So as when you start it up, and we'll be priming this later, you're gonna prime it until the oil goes through the lifters and then up the push rods and you see it gurgling out but we'll have assembly lube on everything so you don't start it up dry it's been worn in so all these parts are put away the way they came off the engine we're putting them back together because all these parts have already broken in with each other and just lubing it up I'm just trying to get an extra couple of years off of it I don't know if you listen to the old stories that I told but a guy had a two, uh, 351 Cleveland, but it was called a two barrel and nobody even at the parts dealers would even know what the engine was And he drove it around and he had a girlfriend really far away And he'd be putting tons of miles on his car and he was never changing the oil it started making a noise and So I says well you can hear it with a screwdriver against the valve covers Let's look under there and I I couldn't get the valve covers off this is all turned to gel and the oil you know, they've made oils better now, but at that time, he would just add oil. The push rods weren't even hollow anymore. The oil wasn't coming up. And then this part, you'll see, has grooves, and it sits down in here, and it's keeping the rocker arm from dancing this way. It keeps it aligned. It's supposed to move. His were worn down where there was a quarter inch shelf, you can see they're starting to wear here. And his were down so that the, the rockers were clacking. They weren't getting any oil. So we had to go buy these and these were hard to find even way back in 1974 or so. And you're trying to describe it to somebody and that's the dude that put the manifold on that had ports this big but a 351 Cleveland two barrel had real small little ports and it worked I couldn't believe it it would be coming in like this size of a hole going into a smaller hole 
and it ran. So I just put this drop of assembly lube. This stuff hangs in there like honey. And see the wider part matches up with those grooves that are in there. The bolt goes through here. Now this is a deflector, so when the oil comes gurgling up through the push rod, it hits there and directs the oil to where this is going to be wearing. It's nice and lubricated now. 9.5 right. 5. The one that uh, we checked before, the stock one. And this is closer, it's 9.502. It's perfect, 9.5. Right on the money. So this is a comp cams replacement push rod set. I've believed in comp cams ever since they came out. When I used to work at a speed shop and I trusted everything my boss said. He was like my idol and he used to use cam dynamics. And all these other guys would say, oh, I like crane. And then there's tons of cams out there. And then I've had friends that just bought a cam that would be a replacement cam that you can buy through Elgin or whatever. And they were happy with them. But when you have comp cams, they have a person that you can call up and then tell them what you're going for. And they can design a cam for you or tell you which one you can buy that would fit into your you know, parameters that you're building. The biggest mistake a lot of guys do is Put the wrong cam in their car, like that Cougar we did. And if you don't have enough compression, you got too much lift and duration, it just makes it doggier. You gotta build it around what you're gonna be building it for. So when he was getting uh, to the point of putting it back together, we found that the push rods were bent. I, just, I can straighten that thing. And <laughs> I thought I was better than what I was. <laughs> I couldn't get it straight. So there is a difference and we measured them, it was like 25 thousandths, just having a little bend and I tried putting them in a vise, I tried tapping them between two things and you're rolling, it's going whoa, 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 whoa. What was 30 some dollars for some new push rods? I think it's just so you can sleep at night, you got new push rods. Right, they're all the same length so you're going to have all the same lift across your motor. Right. A dab of assembly lube and all the valve stem tips. A little bit on each end of the push rod. I got enough of the ultra torque lube stuff left. I'm putting them on the, uh, the bolts for these pedestals. So these push rods have a big enough hole to where you can see the, the hole going all the way through the push rods. But I've even heard stories of guys that got brand new push rods and there was stuff inside here. A lot of guys will blow these out. Some guys will end up putting assembly lube or dabs of grease on the ends because they don't want to start their engine up dry. But they sat for four years doing the project, life happens, kids, and you don't get to work on it. And I've heard of guys that had stuff that dried up clogged up the holes and all of a sudden they got one cylinder that's going clack 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 and the oil can't get up. So there's all, you know, you should always use assembly lube. Something that'll stay liquid and not get hardened or whatever. And when you fire up your engine, be listening for everything. A lot of times it's nice to take the valve covers off and watch it and see that oil's coming out of everywhere and retorque. You see this ARP assembly loom? To get proper torque, they give you this stuff that reduces friction. So you put some on the threads and underneath here. So then as you torque this down, you're getting a true reading on the torque and not the friction of the threads into the metal. See how all these push rods are at different angles? The reason being is this is called a canted valve engine, which is nice. Let's it breathe better. If you're used to a small block Chevy, the old style, that's what I grew up with. They're cheap. Everybody, you know, starts off with something that's inexpensive. And that's called a wedge style engine. Push rods are all same length, all straight, and the valves are side by side. And 
there's a pro and a con for everything on an engine. That is, um, you know, a tight little combustion chamber, the spark plug's real close. Once you squeeze the fuel into that area, the flame doesn't have to travel as far. And there's problems with it too. It's called valve shrouding. When the valve's opening up, you're off on one half side of the cylinder and the air is trying to come out of the valve and it's up against the back side and doesn't breathe as well. A Hemi has one push rod going to a real long rocker on the opposite side of the combustion chamber and a shorter push rod on the other side and they're coming in like this. They're going, the valves are going to the center of the, you know, the center of the cylinder. So the air can go all the way around the valve, breathes really great. Only problem is, like my old shovel head, a lot of times the flame can't travel that far. You know, this is happening really fast at high RPM. So on mine, I got two spark plugs, and the old Chrysler Hemis had two spark plugs too. Because a lot of times the flame can't even get across the dome. They smartened up later on trying to make that combustion chamber smaller. So when you see an Evo engine on a Harley, it's called a dual quench. It's a Hemi, the later style one. They go, is it a Hemi? Well, it's a Hemi, but it's got a bathtub shaped combustion chamber. So you're squeezing all the fuel into a tighter area, but the valves can still work. They breathe great. And then they're packing it into a smaller area so the flame doesn't have to travel as far to burn it. It's just every engine's a little bit different. You got to get used to it. So we're going through here. We're cranking on these rocker arm and pairs. We're on to number six. That'd be these number, two. Here's number five. Here's number six. And we got the lifters on the base circle. We're just going to crank these pedestals down to the bottom out on that that stand. There's a torque spec. I think we got. 25 foot pounds on this. And this is a non adjustable valve train. What's nice about these is the pedestal itself has sides and it keeps the rocker from dancing around. On a Chevy, they're all adjustable, but it's got a ball and the rocker you know, can go all over the place if it did, you know. Um, like if, if you over rev it and the push rod goes flying, this thing is going to be going all around this. This actually keeps them in alignment. So a lot of times when you have a roller cam, this kind of a lifter can just spin around. But a roller cam has to stay straight. And they usually have guide bars that tie the two lifters together. Or they have multiple ways of keeping these from spinning around. When you got a roller wheel, it's got to stay perpendicular to the lobe, or if it turned the other way, it would fall off and everything would go to hell. We cranked this pedestal down to this stand, but if you had like a really bad valve job and all the valves were installed at different heights, these could be shimmed. Underneath there. Right. When I grew up with a Chevy, and they had studs, you could get pressed in studs, or you get screw-in studs. You say, what's the diff? Well, pressed-in studs, fine for an economy car. But if you start increasing spring pressure and you're increasing height, as you're winding this thing out, it can start lifting the stud right out. So, so back in the old days, guys would fix it by drilling a hole in there and putting a pin in there. A lot of times the whole thing broke. So then they started tapping them out and threading them. You put a... Um, screw in stud and they use Loctite. That kind of a lifter on a small block Chevy, you know, just flops all around. You can just adjust your valve train no matter what. Like he said, if somebody did a crummy valve job and all these valves are at different height, you can just take up the play and you usually get it to the point where there's no slop in it and then you go to half turn and you're good to go. When I saw a Chrysler and they had this shaft on it and I was young, I go, what a pain in the ass. You know, I was used to a Chevy, and you lift this whole thing off. Then you find out later on when you're into race cars and all this stuff is just, 
it's wiggling all over the place at high RPM. So guys will put like a stud girdle that ties them all together, but just in the process of tightening that down, sometimes your adjustments can go out. The shaft with the Chrysler is the strongest design. There's a lot of stuff that Chrysler came up with for high performance that just, you know, is above and beyond what the other manufacturers did for rigidity and keeping all your rockers and your valve trains steady at high RPM.